Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar on company loans and how to use them as a tool for business expansion and investments. Um, firstly, I'd like to pay respect to the traditional traditional owners of the land from which I'm presenting, the Moanina people, to pay respect to those um, that have passed before us and to acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal people who are the custodians of this land. I also want to acknowledge and pay respect to the past, present and emerging traditional custodians and elders of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, whose land our Sydney headquarters is situated on and the various lands on which those of you are joining us. All right, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Joel. I'm a senior lawyer in Legal Vision. I'm joined today by my colleague Ingrid, who is also a senior lawyer in our Legal Vision team. We both do quite a lot of work in the banking, finance, and loan space. Now, before we begin with the um, substantive part of the webinar, some few quick housekeeping items. Firstly, you'll receive the recording and the slides in your email after the webinar. Secondly, feel free to submit questions in the chat box during the webinar. We'll answer them at the end. And finally, please complete the feedback survey after the webinar. It really helps us in making these webinars. All right, um, another housekeeping matter. All attendees are eligible to receive a free consultation with us um, to discuss how we can help you with any of your financial, uh, sorry, any of your legal needs. Um, to request your free consultation, just provide us with your contact details in the survey that appears at the end of the webinar. Alrighty, so today we'll be discussing, um, firstly, what is a loan? We'll explore different types of loans. We'll explore what the key terms of a loan um, are. We'll talk about some hidden issues that always pop up when we talk about loans. And finally, we'll have the Q&A at the end. Now, just to let you know, a lot of what we'll be discussing today will have some, um, some form or another, some interplay with tax. Um, however, neither Ingrid nor myself are tax lawyers, so uh, we won't be discussing any tax implications in any great detail in this webinar. All right, so the first component of today's webinar is really what is a loan. Now, a loan is where a person, the lender, provides funds to another person, the borrower, with the understanding that the funds will be repaid. Now, while they do have similarities, loans are different from investments and gifts. Now, let's have a look at what those differences are. Now, in terms of funds being provided, they all share that similarity. They all result in monies going from one person to another. In terms of expectation for repayment, when we talk about loans, yes, it's its very definition, it needs to be repaid. Now, with investments, um, it's a big maybe, depending on the shape and form of the investments. Ingrid will go through one of them, which is convertible notes. So I'll leave that aside for now. But with gifts, you'll notice that there's no expectation of repayments. Makes sense. It's a gift. It's a present. All right. Um, consideration. Now, for loans, the consideration for the loan is usually in the form of interest or so interest rates. We've heard a lot of these, um, the word interest rate over the news over the last few months. Um, now, in investments, the consideration is usually a stake or some form of equity in the company. And for gifts, there's no consideration. And when we talk about the next um, characteristic, which is security, for loans, it's optional. It's purely a matter of commercial negotiation between the parties. Um, can be there, cannot be there. Depends. Investments, there's no security. And with gifts, there's obviously no security since there's no expectation of repayment. Now, in terms of nicknames or terminology, you will hear the words debt financing and equity financing being thrown around quite, thrown ar around quite a lot. Basically, what they are is when, we, when a company talks about debt financing, it really refers to a company trying to get finances or money through the form of debt, i.e. loans. Equity financing is a situation where a company is trying to get money. In return, they are giving out or issuing equity shares, debentures, bonds, options, yeah, things like that. Um, and in gifts, um, obviously the other common phrase for it is donations, right? Now, in terms of tax implications, um, each of them has, has their own, all right? So it's important to obviously um, get uh, advice where necessary. 
In today's webinar, we'll only be focusing on loans. Now, be mindful, of course, that loans can take many different shapes um, and forms. In fact, they can even be called many different things. So I'll pass on to Ingrid now, who will walk you through some of the common ones we usually see. Thanks, Joel. Um, so just as Joel sort of had said already, whilst loans often have some of the same fundamental features for all of them, there is often many different terms used to describe them, different terms used to describe the same loans and different types offered to borrowers. And a lots of uh, different terminology used in the, the loan banking finance sector can sometimes get a little bit confusing. So to start with, I'll run through some loans where the company is a borrower. One of the most common forms we see um, for small, medium businesses and startup companies is director and shareholder loans. Under these loans, directors or shareholders provide funds to the company, um, often in the early months or years of the company, to get uh, startup capital, to get um, the business going. This is often um, the kinds of loans we see sort of right after incorporation of a company. Usually there's either a very low interest rate or no interest payable on the loan. Um, and the loan has a very long repayment term so that there's no pressure on the company in its initial years to um, repay a significant amount of financial, uh, of a significant amount of finances. Uh, as they just are starting to enter business. The second common form of loan that we see is called a convertible note. This is a half investment, half loan arrangement where an investor provides funds to the company and in exchange, that amount of money must be repaid either uh, as funds with uh, debt, as a, a piece of debt as an ordinary loan would be, potentially with an interest payment on top of that, or it's in a sense repaid or converted into equity in the company. These are often uh, linked to or entered into intent in anticipation of formal capital raising rounds and might be converted just before those rounds so that um, the funds of the company are clear and that the, yeah, the, the investors at all stages understand who has an ownership interest in the company. Uh, another common form of loan is called a term loan. This is a, a common form that you'll find offered by say big banks um, or big financiers. It basically means that a loan is given with a fixed repayment term often used and it's often used for medium and long-term financing needs. Uh, these types of loans, as I said, are often provided by big banks and they'll say, here is an amount of money, you need to repay it in three years, five years, something like that. You must repay it either in instalments or it will be in one lump sum at the end of the term. So that is particularly key and sort of term loans are seen as something that is structured according to when the repayments are due. On the other hand, you have um, loans that are called working capital loans or growth capital loans. The title of these loans are less linked to repayment or interest or con whether they're convertible and more linked to what the loan can be used for. What's the purpose of that loan? These could be short term, they could be term loans for medium or long periods. And usually for a working capital loan, it's used to cover the day-to-day -day operational expenses of a company, such as payroll, inventory, utilities, all the normal outgoings that occur in the day-to-day -day operations of a business. On the other hand, growth capital loans or others with similar names are are put in place to finance and support a company's expansion initiatives. So this might be a scenario where um, a company borrows an amount of money for a new product development, for a new product launch, for market entry into a new market, or to fund an acquisition of another business or another business unit or a particular asset. And similarly, 
another form of financing called equipment financing is linked to the purpose of the loan. Uh, and the use of those funds is usually very closely limited to the purpose of the loan. For example, with the equipment financing, the loan must be used to purchase or lease new equipment or machinery. Um, and that will usually be done to enhance productivity and efficiency within a business. And the, the lender is saying, we think it is worth you having this and that in the long term, you can pay us back uh, for the money we've given you to lease or purchase this piece of equipment. And if you don't, we can come take that equipment, sell it to someone else and get our money back. So this is uh, linked to, therefore, taking security over that specific piece of equipment. Security is our concept that Joel will explain in a bit further detail in a moment. Um, and similar to equipment loans, where uh, the loan amount is secured against a specific piece of equipment, we also have commercial mortgages, which is a loan secured by commercial real estate. And it's often used for property acquisition, uh, expansion or refinancing. Now, commercial uh, mortgages are in a lot of ways very similar to residential mortgages. When someone buys a house, the bank provides money secured against a particular property. And if uh, something goes wrong and it can't be repaid, the bank can use that property to recoup its money. Another form of finance that's common is what's called trade finance. And this is again, financing linked to a specific purpose. It can be used to facilitate international trade by providing working capital for importing and exporting goods. Another form of credit or a form of financing and loans is called revol revolving lines of credit. Um, these are flexible credit lines or flexible amounts of money that are made available to a company to borrow and that, that they can repay and redraw and repay and redraw. Uh, within a predetermined limit for a predetermined amount of time. Uh, examples of this include overdraft facilities and credit cards. Um, these are forms of credit basically, which is different to a term loan where a repayment is made and you can't then pull that money back. With revolving lines of credit, if you make a repayment, you can usually then re-borrow re that exact amount of money. Another type of financing that we often see is called invoice financing. And this is used where, um, where companies want to uh, take a, slightly, a slight discount on the amount of money they would or ordinarily receive from their customers in order to get immediate cash flow. So this is generally linked to increasing the ongoing cash flow and liquidity of a business. Under these types of financing, we often see a company sell its accounts receivables to a lender at a discount to access that immediate cash. And then the lender can uh, recoup uh, the, the amount of money that it's lent, plus the interest or um, the profit they make off the transaction by uh, receiving in full the amount of money that is being paid by the company's customers. A final form of loan uh, that we can chat about today is a bridging loan. These are short-term loans that you'll hear about, and these are usually used to bridge a financial gap between transactions. So again, this is linked to uh, the purpose of the loan um, and often uh, have a very short term to them. So they'll be term loans that are linked to a pending sale or a few future financing round. And it's just the amount of money to get the company to the next step. Now, the next um, list of loans that we have to consider here are uh, loans where the company is the lender. So we're not talking about companies such as banks where their business is lending. We're talking more about an ordinary company who has um, a non-banking business and the types of financing that they still might be providing to others in their sphere. The first one is what we call vendor financing. 
Um, vendor financing is where a seller of an asset or a business provides a loan to a person to assist them to acquire that business or asset. <clears throat> it's similar in a way to providing goods on credit terms where your customer can buy your goods and then they pay for those over a period of time. You might also hear the term financial assistance in connection with this style of loan, which we'll discuss in more detail later on. Another form of loan that we see is called a limited recourse loan as part of an employee share scheme. These loans are used to provide employees or prospective employees with an opportunity to invest in the company um, by in, a, in essence loaning them the money to do so. And if they're unable to pay that back, which they would usually do from distributions from the company over time, then the company can buy back those shares or have another shareholder buy back those shares. Another form of loan you'll often see in companies is an intercompany loan. These are common types of loan where what loans where one company provides a favourable loan to another company in the group to enable that company to operate the business in a certain way or to go into some sort of expansion. Because it's all within one group of companies, they're usually on fairly favourable terms. The final form of uh, lender of loans where a company is the lender that you need to be particularly aware of is what's called a Division 7A loan. This is where a company lends money to a shareholder or pays for something on behalf of a shareholder. These can have very unintended tax consequences for the shareholder and be taken to be a dividend for that shareholder if the loan doesn't comply with certain requirements. We always recommend that clients speak to our tax lawyers before entering into these loans. Now, Joel is going to uh, spend some time going through the key terms and the things that you need to be thinking about when taking out a loan. Yep, thanks Ingrid. Um, yeah, so now, regardless of what form the loan takes or whatever it's called, here are the key terms um, of any loan, really. The first is the principal amount. This refers to the amount of money that the lender lends to the borrower. It can be a fixed amount, um, or as Ingrid mentioned in some of her examples, a revolving facility, like a credit card, where you have an upper limit and you can make multiple redraws and repayments. Um, the loan agreement, however, it's fundamental that it specifies whether or not the borrower can request further amounts under the same loan or whether that's it, uh, the principal amount is the be all end all. The next key term is the purpose of the loan. As Ingrid mentioned as well, a lot of um, loans are um, structured around the purpose. So this refers to the specific purpose for which the borrower is allowed to use the loan funds. Generally speaking, any use outside of this purpose will be considered to be a breach of the loan. All right, and the third key term of a loan um, is the interest rate. Um, this refers to the amount the borrower will need to pay on top of the principal amount. Again, there's a lot of flexibility here. It can be a fixed amount, it can be a percentage, or it can even be what we call a floating number. And a common example of a floating number is, just as an example, 2% above the RBA cash rate from time to time. So as the RBA cash rate goes up and down, so too does the interest rate. And then we have the fourth key term of the loan, which is the repayment. And this refers to the schedule and the methods of repayment. Payment, repayments can be by way of installments, so we're talking about the frequency of payments, you know, is it monthly, is it quarterly? We're also talking about the number, total number of installment payments. Now, it is also possible and common um, for the entirety of the loan to be repaid at the final repayment date. This is often what we um, call in the industry balloon repayment. And in any event, when we're talking about interest rate, uh, oh, sorry, when we're talking about repayments, it is important that the loan agreement sets out a final repayment date by which all amounts under the loan must be repaid, come what may. All right, and that, that brings us to the next key term, prepayment, not to be confused with repayment. Now, 
Prepayment is basically early repayments. So when we talk about this, it generally covers two points. Firstly, whether prepayment or early repayments are allowed. And secondly, if yes, whether there'll be any early repayment fee that the borrower must pay. Um, and then that brings us to default. Now default is one of the big clauses in any loan agreement. These are the events that would be considered a default or breach of the loan. Common events of default are um, failure to make payments. That's the most common one. Um, insolvency or bankruptcy of the borrower. Um, any other breaches of the loan agreement. Um, it, yeah, a lot of it is negotiated as well. So sometimes you see um, clauses um, and events of default that say borrowing from any other lenders or any cross securitizing of assets, those will also be breaches. So these events of default are usually, um, and these clauses usually set out um, what the lender can do if there is an event of default. Often, this means that um, the lender can accelerate the loan, in other words, making everything due and payable immediately, or even seizing any collateral. It's important, obviously, to make sure that default events um, in your loan agreement will not impede your business plan. For example, um, if you're in a early stage days or you're a startup, can you really agree to a clause prohibiting you from getting lending from other third parties? Uh, it might be a bit onerous. So be very careful when you look at these clauses. And then the final key term of um, a loan would be security. Security refers to assets that are offered up to the lender to be used to secure the loan. So the question we ask is, is the loan going to be secured? If yes, is it going to be registered? Those are the legal questions we ask. Now, broadly speaking, the most common forms of securities that we see in loans um, are PPSRs, mortgages, and caveats. Um, don't worry, we'll explore these, what these are in the next few slides. And take note as well that security might take the form of guarantees. And again, we'll explore this in the next few slides. Okay, so as promised, let's look at what a guarantee is. A guarantee is basically a contractual promise whereby a third party, the guarantor, agrees to fulfill the obligations of the borrower if the borrower fails to do so. In other words, if a borrower defaults on their obligations under a contract, for whatever reason, the lender can then pursue the guarantor for um, payment or for fulfillment of those obligations. Common examples that we usually see is um, the first one is where a company obtains a business loan, let's say from a bank, and then the director is asked to personally guarantee the company's performance under that loan. Another common example we see is where directors are asked to provide personal guarantees to suppliers in order for um, the company to obtain credit accounts with those key suppliers. Now take note as well that security obligations like PPSR, mortgages, and caveats, which I'm about to talk about soon, they can also extend to the guarantors depending on the terms of the guarantee document. So it is important to look at those documents. All right, so that brings us to PPSR. So the Personal Property Securities Register, in short, PPSR. It's a national online register of security interests in personal property. The PPSR is used to register security interests over all forms of personal property. You know, we're talking about um, any property that isn't real property. And these examples include cars, equipment, inventory, cash, so on and so forth. Now take note that the PPSR is publicly searchable. You can search it, I can search it, everyone can search it. So just be mindful of this. Now, PPSR registrations are important to a lender because it determines the priority over the security. In terms of priority, generally speaking, um, anyone who is registered will rank ahead of anyone who is unregistered. And those amongst those who have registered, those who have registered earlier 
will rank ahead of those who have registered later. There are a few quirks here and there with um, how the PPSR works, but generally speaking, this is the rule. Now, the loan agreement or security document will generally set out also what the lender can and cannot do if there is a default. But often, this means that the lender will be able to take possession and potentially selling the asset that they have securitized. Now, for lenders, improper registration uh, will significantly, or even no registration, will significantly weaken or even void the security interests in the asset. So, which is why, as a lender, um, at least lenders who have uh, legal advice, would be going the mile of making a proper PPSR registration. Now, borrowers, on the other hand, you should ensure that lenders remove the PPSR registration once the monies have been paid in full. Okay, so that brings us now to mortgages and caveats, the other types of securities we often see. Now, security interest over real property um, will be done usually by ways of mortgages and caveats. So just as a refresher, PPSR is for personal property, mortgages and caveats are for real property. Now, what's a mortgage? A mortgage is basically a loan that's secured over real property. The lender has a security interest in the property, which means that they can generally foreclose on the property if the borrower defaults on the loan. A caveat, on the other hand, is a notice that is lodged against a property title. It basically warns other people that there is an interest in the property that they should be aware of. Um, take note that a caveat can affect land transactions in a number of ways. For example, a caveat can actually prevent properties from being sold or transferred um, because generally if a buyer does a search and they find that there's a caveat, they'll be like, hold up, I don't want to get involved in this, I'm not buying it. Um, caveats can also affect the ability um, for someone to obtain finance over a property because if a bank see it, they'll be asking lots of questions as well. Now, both mortgages and caveats are usually registered on the property's title, but as a borrower, again, like the PPSR, you should ensure that there is an obligation for the lender to remove the mortgage or the caveat once the monies have been repaid in full. All right. So now that we've explored um, the key terms that appear in a loan agreement, um, let's also have a look, I guess, at what key issues might appear outside a loan agreement. So I'll pass on to Ingrid to walk you through what these hidden issues can be. Thanks, Joel. Uh, one of the first things that we always need to be aware of when thinking about um, a loan or a financing in a company uh, is called financial assistance. And you might have heard the term financial assistance thrown around in relation to loans generally. Uh, this term re relates to a company financially assisting a person to acquire shares in the company or its holding company. And the Corporations Act generally prohibits a company from doing this, except in very limited circumstances. So generally, when anyone is borrowing money or receiving some form of financial assistance to help acquire a company, um, this issue definitely needs to be considered. So where a company can provide financial assistance, such as loaning money, or where they uh, can provide a guarantee or security on behalf of someone acquiring shares in the company. Um, financial assistance, this, these forms of financial assistance can be given if the assistance is approved by shareholders using uh, the process that's set out in the Corporations Act, which includes certain notifications to ASIC. Uh, the financial assistance can be given if it does not materially prejudice the interests of the company or its shareholders or the company's ability to pay its creditors. When we say materially prejudice, we mean materially harm the company's ability and mean that they won't be able to, um, or it might sort of uh, put in doubt their ability to pay creditors or um, conflicts with the interests of the company or its shareholders. There are some other specific exemptions to this requirement. In general, a company can give financial assistance where it's provided in the ordinary course of commercial dealing, and it consists of acquiring or creating a lien on partly paid shares in the company, 
or entering into arrangement uh, for someone to make uh, payments to the company for the shares that they're receiving by instalments. There are also exemptions in certain circumstances for financial institutions or employee share schemes or in relation to share capital uh, reductions, share buybacks, um, and, and a few other things which we have, which we have listed on the slide here. Um, the key one that we then generally find is that these, uh, this financial assistance, if it's required, will be done through the shareholder approval process because it removes doubt as to whether the company should or or should not be providing this financial assistance. Another key issue uh, that we need to be considering is director's duties. So um, whenever a company enters into a transaction, particularly a very significant transaction, and usually obtaining or given finances and loans or credit is a significant transaction, um, directors must turn their minds as they do with all of their dealings with the company to their duties, such as their duty to act in the best interests of the company, to exercise care, skill and diligence and to avoid conflicts of interest. They also must uh, ensure that the company does not trade while it's insolvent or would become insolvent from uh, entering into a transaction. So we always recommend when a company, when directors are considering loans, whether that's giving a loan or receiving a loan, um, that they turn their minds to their director's duties and whether what they're doing or proposing to do uh, is in the best interest of the company um, and aligns with their duties to the company. Another uh, possible thing that might be important for a company con to consider, particularly if they're a public company or a subsidiary of a public company uh, is obligations around related party transactions. Um, so disclosure uh, obligations around this and potential approvals that need to be obtained under the Corporations Act by certain companies if they're going to enter into a, a transaction with a related party. So in this case, intercompany loans uh, or other uh, forms of loans with directors or shareholders or others that are within the definitions of the Corporations Act related parties. Um, another key thing to consider are the approvals. So some other hidden issues include, um, will, be, will be contained in the company's constitution or their shareholders agreement, uh, where certain levels of approval, such as a special resolution by directors or shareholders or both, will be needed to take out loans of certain levels or to give security or to take, to give a mortgage, for example, over certain property. It's important that whenever um, entering into some, some of these transactions, that the constitution and shareholders agreement are reviewed and checked for any approval requirements or other requirements that might be placed on the company. You should also consider um, whether there is a conflict of interest for a director or shareholder in regards to the transaction and whether uh, someone needs to, for example, abstain from voting at a board meeting in relation to a loan that's being given by themselves or a related shareholder. Uh, finally, the other key implications to consider are the tax implications for the company as a lender or a borrower. Uh, and these implications will or may occur uh, when the transaction is entered into initially, but also down the track um, as interest payments are received or given, uh, or when a loan is forgiven. There are also very specific tax rules around Vision 7A loans, transfer pricing, deemed dividends and thin capitalisation rules that should be considered. We also always recommend seeking professional tax advice. Uh, we're almost now at the end of the substantive part of our uh, webinar. Just as a quick summary, the key uh, things to take away are understanding that there's a big difference between a loan and investment and a gift, and to really think about when your company needs money, uh, what do we need, what form do we need that to take and what's going to be best for our company. Um, be aware that there are many different loans available and they use many different names. Um, whether that's for the company to borrow or to lend. And it's important to 
uh, understand the key terms of the loan. So whatever it is called, looking back at the purpose uh, that the money must be used for, the interest repayment terms and the things that Joel set out earlier, because they are the key things that will drive um, how this loan interacts with your business. Always be aware of the hidden issues that we've walked through. And we do recommend that you get professional advice, including legal advice, financial advice, and tax advice. All right. So that concludes the main part of our webinar. You might also find our loan fact sheet useful. You can download this by accessing the handout panel in this webinar or just by scanning the QR code that's on the slide. We also want to bring your attention to an upcoming event that may be of interest to you. It's on cracking the due diligence code and it gives some insider tips on buying businesses. Now, this is going to be held on Thursday, the 31st of August at 11 a.m. Sydney time. You can register for this at legalvision.com.au slash events. All right, we are going to answer your questions shortly, I promise. Um, but while we give you some time to submit them, um, we'll take a minute to tell you about our membership. Um, Legal Vision's membership is a cost-effective alternative to the expensive hourly rates that you generally experience with other law firms. For an affordable monthly fee, um, you receive cost certainty and you get an all-inclusive legal services. Now, this includes unlimited document reviews, you know, including drafting, amending, reviewing, um, things like business contracts, commercial leases, um, loan agreements. You also get unlimited advice consultations with our team of over 100 specialist lawyers. Um, you know, anything from business structuring, employment, disputes, banking, loans, um, and more. You also get unlimited domestic trademark registrations, all included as part of your fees. Legal Vision membership is pretty much like having your own in-house counsel. We'll take care of all the business as usual legal work, just so that you can focus on running a business. And if you are yourself an in-house counsel, our membership is a cost-effective solution for outsourcing additional legal work. To learn more about how membership can help you, feel free to request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of this webinar. Okay, so that brings us to the Q&A. Um, so a couple of questions have come through. I'll take the first one. Um, it says, can you please explain how companies loan, company loans work for a business that is registered as a partnership versus a private company? What are the associated pros and cons between the different structures with respect to loans from owners? Okay, so I think with this one, fundamentally, the questions are, the legal questions at least, will be the same. We're going to ask who is the lender and who is the borrower. In the case of a, a company, the I'm gathering from this question that the lender is either a shareholder or a director, because you're probably likely the founder, and you are lending to the company. So the company would then be the borrower. So these are the two parties of the um, of the loan agreement. In with respect to the partnership, a partnership, unlike a company, is not a legal entity. So it will be, you know, for example, between partner A and the part and all the partners. So you're lending to all the partners, um, and the purpose of the loan will be for the you know, business of the partnership. In terms of um, pros and cons um, of the two. It's not very much, I think, a question of the loans, but really of pros and cons in terms of structuring generally. Um, it's really what are the pros and cons of partnership versus the pros and cons of a um, company. And I think that's probably um, more well suited for a webinar all on its own. Um, but generally speaking, the difference between these two loans is who is the borrower, the company versus every partner in a partnership. Yeah. I might pass it to Ingrid to take um, the next one. So thanks, Joel. Um, we've had a question about bank bills. So basically, what about bank bills? Um, bank bills are another form of loan. Um, there are out there uh, a lot of different names uh, for different sort of what we call debt instruments that often come down to sort of, uh, in practical terms, very similar uh, considerations around what needs to, what is being lent in return for what interest rate 
uh, and what are the repayment terms. And bank bills, um, you know, you'll see them like letters of credit and things like that, where, um, you know, fundamentally it's kind of seen as an IOU or uh, similar to a, a check uh, that we used to be a lot more common than it is now, um, where there they are debt instruments and, and sort of basically being like, I promise to pay this person this amount of money. And that amount of money usually is made up of the interest rate and um, the principal amount, so the amount that was lent for that. You can also see that where um, essentially banks are the borrowers and it's kind of like an investment instrument where a person will invest in the bank in return for um, an amount of money being returned to them at some point. And often these can be transferred, basically the lender can transfer the debt easily to someone else. Um, but fundamentally, you will find there's a lot of different terminology in this space for different forms of loan that have some differences in structure or in uh, what we would sort of see historically as fundamental, the legal characteristic of these forms of financing. Um, but in practical terms, it generally does come down to uh, what amount of money is being received and what are the terms of that in terms of repayment interest or security and those those sorts of things. Joel, is there another question for you to answer? Yep, there's this one that's come through as well. Um, it asks, can lawyers participate in structuring loans? If so, how do you resolve the conflict of interest to help startup clients? Can we deliver work to firms like Legal Vision? Um, the answer to all those questions is yes. Um, we can, as lawyers do assist. So generally when we're talking about loans in companies, in an ideal world, we always say it, it will be a tag team collaboration between lawyers and your accountants. Um, so we obviously can navigate all the legal sides of things. So, you know, in terms of drafting the document, uh, drafting the terms of the loan, um, in terms of resolving conflicts of interest, if your shareholders agreement or constitution requires special procedures, we can help all lawyers um, should be able to assist with that. But obviously where your accountant steps in is to advise you financially, is this the viable thing? Is this a deduction? Is this an income? Is this a, you know, what's a tax treatment? So um, generally speaking, it should be a tax team effort between lawyers and accountants. And yes, um, Ingrid and I obviously do quite a lot of work on the legal side. We, we don't do accounts. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah. Ingrid, there's, I think we have time probably for the one more question. Do you want to take the one that just came in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Joel. Um, so we have a, a question around commercial property loans and the bank um, asking for a guarantee and security from a personal home. Um, this, in a sense, comes down to a commercial equation. Banks uh, at different times have different um, willing levels of willingness to lend money. Um, and they also have to lend money in scenarios um, where they think that they'll be able to be repaid and it's a reasonable situation. Um, it, it's unusual in certain circumstances, depending on the business, for uh, private residences to include it as a loan for business purposes. But we do occasionally see that where um, it's a very small business um, and things like that. The question though always for the borrower and the company and those involved is um, how important is this amount of money? Do we want to try and find another bank that will give us a different deal? Um, and uh, are we willing to provide as security additional guarantees from different people such as our spouses and whether, um, yeah, we think that it's reasonable for our circumstances and the amount of money we're receiving to have a loan provided um, that has uh, basically security over our personal residence. Um, in certain circumstances, I have seen that being asked for where the amount of, loan, of the loan is a very small amount. Um, and if, that's the case, it seems unreasonable to me to have uh, a say uh, for like very broad brush example, um, having security over a house that's worth 
$1 million for a loan that is 20 grand. So a really small amount of money. Um, they're usually the circumstances where we um, are concerned about the level of security, but the risk is always that the bank will not lend unless the security that they want is given. I don't know, Joel, if you have an opinion on that one. Yeah, generally speaking, it's it's really up to the bank. Different banks have different appetites. Um, generally, what we've found is that um, smaller banks tend to have a slightly larger risk appetite. Um, yeah, but it really, yeah, it really depends on things um, and how you negotiate those loans with the banks. Um, but n I wouldn't say anything is particularly unusual because, yeah, the banks at the end of the day go after whoever has, you know, a big reserve of assets just so that they know that if anything happens, they can chase someone, whoever that someone is. But yeah. Well, um, there are a few more questions that have come through, but unfortunately, that's uh, we've hit the time limit um, for the webinar today. Now, um, this is not to say this is the be all end all. After the webinar ends, a survey will pop up. Um, we really appreciate it if you could complete a, just a 30 second survey. Um, feel free to include your contact details so that you can receive a complimentary legal consultations. Um, and that might include some of the questions that you've just sent through. And we can then help you navigate those, um, you know, uh, financing and loan questions and any other laws that will apply to your business. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we wish you a very good day ahead. Thanks, everyone.